Welcome to Strange Loop. This is the first talk that I'm actually able to pay attention to on account of essentially having been writing my own talk up until this very point. So this is going to be exciting. I've got a lot of code. I've got a lot of code in my slides that is supposed to work, and it's probably going to be a catastrophic failure, but that's half the fun of it, isn't it? So I'm here to talk to you about pure script and uh, I suppose, um, yeah, you know what, let's just get started. Let's talk about JavaScript. Um, actually, let's not talk about JavaScript. I think at this point, uh, going on and on and on about how, how frightfully awful JavaScript is has it's been said already. I mean, for one thing, two years ago, uh, almost to this very day, uh, Brendan Eich was standing right here on this stage, apologizing for JavaScript. I think we're sort of the, the point where we are arguing whether or not JavaScript is a great language. It is not. It's generally something that every, uh, every growing functional programmer really wants to avoid. So we are all out there looking for alternatives. And that's certainly been, been my position on JavaScript for at least the last five years. Um, if you're still not so on, on, on the, the horror of JavaScript, let me give you a brief summary. It's a mess. <laughs> TLDR. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about me. People keep congratulating me for this picture. I, I'm not quite sure why. It's a lovely thing, though. Anyway, so. Um, since I was here at Strange Loop last, um, things have been happening in my life. So for one thing, I decided to move from Norway, um, essentially, where I used to live for the last many, many decades. Norway is, th this picture pretty much sums it up very neatly. <laughs> uh, the weather's absolutely de depressing, and the music uh, adjusts to cope, sort of goes beyond this, screaming your rage at existence. And, and you have to scream about that much to, to actually cope with living in Norway. Uh, I know what you're all thinking. Norway looks like this, right? This is like, well, yeah. I mean, it's said that summer in Norway is, is the most beautiful day of the year. And <laughs> sometimes something like this happens. This, this looks Photoshopped, though, to be honest. But it's you know, occasionally in nice. But for the most part, it looks like this. <laughs> Literally, uh, the, the Hoth scenes from, from The Empire Strikes Back were actually filmed in Norway. Hoth is short for homotopy type theory, I think. <laughs> so I decided to finally come to my senses and move to London. Um, of course, I was gainfully employed in Oslo at the time, so I needed to find an, another job in London to be able to do this. and. So as one does, one picks up one's electric telephone and one <coughs> calls one's friend the internet and asks for advice. So that's essentially, that's literally what I did. I asked on, on, on Twitter, does anybody have a job for me? And after talking to a few people, I ended up working for this little startup in Shoreditch, which does, uh, I, I hate to say the word advertising, but what they do is, um, gamified advertising, and, and the idea is to sort of put the um, the ads in wh where they don't feel utterly obnoxious. Like the the initial product, product which caught my attention was um, they put tiny little games in place of captures that you have to sort of play through. Very simple games, like just drag this thing to here, and you don't have to do a capture essentially. And they were doing this uh, using essentially building the games from scratch using jQuery every every time. So it was obvious that what they needed was a game engine. And that's been my project for the last year. That's, this wasn't supposed to be a commercial message just leading up to, to the fact that I've been building a game engine. And let me show you uh, the sort of game that we have built with this, the, the initial version of it, just to give you an idea. So this is my demo game. I've very carefully chosen a game with, with no branding, but some very very good, good dogs. So the idea here, of course, this is, well, I've, I've, I've ripped everything 
the, the, the graphics out of this game called Flappy Doge, which is, of course, essentially Flappy Bird, except with a better character. So this isn't, of course, the full game. The idea is, as I said, just to, to drag this Doge over through the pipes and, and drop him on the other side, which completes the game. So let me try. Whoa. So very, very carefully and, oops, that didn't work. Let's try again. So there we go. Woo, I win. <laughs> so that's, um, that's essentially the sort of game I had to write a game engine for. And I had um, a few ideas of, of how to do this. For one thing, of course, I wanted it all to be very, very functional. I wanted uh, things like um, immutable data structures or persistent data structures. And, and at least, if I, because we're in JavaScript, if I can't necessarily have those, at least I want to be not doing mutation of, of, of state, which we all know is, is very, very unfunctional. And, and of course, be writing everything in a functional style as much as I can. Um, I also felt like um, I, I'd been playing around with uh, RxJS um, previously. And I felt like it should be possible to, to just take this, um, this game logic and sort of squish it into, into a reactive stream that, that gets input from, from the input devices, like the mouse drag, and, and does something in between. And out at the other end of the stream comes um, a description of what happens on the screen, which you can just pass a render function. Essentially, then, uh, there's, there's impure input. And there's impure output, because you have to actually render to, to the physical world. That's the side effect. And everything in between should be as, as pure and, and referentially transparent as possible, essentially being, once again, functional. And uh, I felt like you should also be able to simply feed animations in as reactive streams into the system. So. Um, I've been using a, a tweening library, which produces reactive streams to describe animations. And that feeds very neatly in, into the, the game loop function. And so when I, I was thinking about the design of this, I realized I've actually read this paper. And there's somebody, I mean, there's quite literally somebody who was on this stage right before me who has had the same idea and actually built a language out of that. So the obvious choice, of course, was to use Elm. And if you didn't get um, an impression of Elm already from Evan, uh, I'd like to describe it as sort of if Haskell were designed by, by a usability expert. <laughs> so it's very, it's very intentionally designed to be, to be user-friendly, uh, is my impression of it. Good God, <laughs> that picture is truly disturbing. Um, <laughs> But I, I had some constraints to deal with. Um, for one thing, as you're making um, these very compact little ads that have to be delivered very, very quickly, the size of, of the deliverable really, really matters. And Elm has um, well, a, a cost in that area, because there is a, a not inconsiderable runtime that has to go with the, the system. Uh, it's not terrifyingly huge, but it's, what was it, about 100 kilobytes? That's still too, too much, sadly. Um, I also have to deal with very unpredictable environments. And um, the Elm runtime, at least at, at the state where I evaluated it, I know it's improved since then. But still, it, um, it sort of makes assumptions that I can't afford to make. I need to be able to, to work around things like your ads being embedded in, in, in pages built by idiots who use, uh, who extend JavaScript prototypes in crazy ways, and you can't really predict where you're going to be. So I needed to be in, in complete control of, of the runtime, which sadly, I mean, I love Elm, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's been an inspiration uh, throughout the process of building this, but sadly, I could not use it. So I ended up having to use TypeScript instead. Um, 
because TypeScript essentially, the TypeScript code actually compiles time to something that is, is smaller than, than the source. It essentially takes TypeScript, strips away the type annotations, and produces JavaScript. And the TypeScript is, is very, very tightly coupled to, to the resulting JavaScript, obviously. But you get type checking for free. So that was, TypeScript is, is not what I would describe as a, as a very, very powerful type system. It's, I've seen worse. I've, I've been a Java developer, but um, still, it's, it's a far cry from Haskell, let's say. So I ended up um, building this in TypeScript because it was the best I had at the time. I did TypeScript, obviously. I used RxJS at first. But you remember the thing about the, the size constraint? RxJS is bake. So I ended up eventually going to bake. And I, RxJS is, 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 in my opinion, more powerful. So if, if you don't have the size constraints and you're looking to do reactive using JavaScript, I would recommend it. Bacon is not far behind, and it compresses down to, what was it, 30 or 40 kilobytes. So that was, well, it wasn't ideal, but I, I got along. And we just essentially built the, the um, game loop reactive stream that I describe and, and feed it into an HTML canvas rendering function. And it's, it's pluggable, so you can do DOM if, if your browser doesn't support canvas and so on. DOM's not great for mobile, though. But throughout the process, I mean, I actually built this, this entire game engine um, using the stack. And there is a working prototype that we are actually using in production now. But I mean, throughout the process, I felt like, why, why couldn't this language be a little more like Haskell? Because once you've done Haskell, you kind of miss the, the expressiveness of the type system, all the crazy things that, that you can do with it. And nothing ever really feels the same again, especially in a TypeScript. And unfortunately, I, I wasn't the only person to have this idea. Um, just uh, essentially at the same time as I started development on this project, uh, PureScript came along. PureScript is implemented in Haskell currently. There's work going on to, to make PureScript in PureScript. Uh, currently, the implementation is in Haskell. It, um, essentially, the selling point is it looks a lot like Haskell. It has most of the power of Haskell, but it sticks close to the JavaScript and produces very, very neat JavaScript code. And there's a there's a little bit of a, of a runtime, but it's neg negligible, like maybe 10 kilobytes. I can't exactly remember. So PureScript is written by, um, originally written by Phil Freeman, whom I could not find um, a high resolution picture of on the internet. So as one does, one Googles for Phil Freeman cosplayer instead. And <laughs> I'm not sure this is a Phil Freeman cosplayer, but it's a Freeman cosplayer. Anyway. <laughs> Um, let me go through the bullet points that, that made PureScript appeal to me. Um, it's got, as I mentioned, a very Haskell syntax, which is nice. It's very close to the JavaScript. It's actually pure. The pure in PureScript is, is not a joke. It, it, the whole language is, is um, it's very targeted towards staying um, a purely functional language. Because that, of course, you have to manage side effects some, in some way. So you've got an effect system that looks a lot like the one in Idris. Um, instead of, in Haskell, you would have ion monads. But instead, we have the effect monad in, in PureScript. You've got, um, obviously, a, a foreign function interface to JavaScript, which essentially lets you do anything you please. Um, there are a few functions that in, in, in the PureScript prelim that start with the word unsafe, and they essentially use the FFI to, to escape purity and do things you, you shouldn't be doing at all. Um, I think of that as sort of a pragmatic choice, but you're not supposed to be touching it. You know, coming from Clojure, I'm, I have this idea that um, you, you try to stay pure for the, for the most part, but if you absolutely have to do nasty things, then you are able to do nasty things. And in PureScript, that happens through the FFI. So 
I figured uh, instead of giving you like a point by point tutorial, I'd actually just show you some PureScript. So this is my REPL. I wrote it um, yesterday. It might or it might not work. Um, and our first exercise is to show you some very, very basic PureScript. If you know Haskell, this is not going to come as a surprise to you. So PureScript uh, lists, using the list syntax, are actually JavaScript arrays. And JavaScript arrays can be a little inefficient looping over them in the traditional Haskell way. So one might want to create a list data structure. This is um, an algebraic data type, which is called list of A which means that the list contains values of type A. And one constructor for that is the cons constructor, which takes one value of type A and another list of type A. And there's the empty list called nil. And I added an implementation of the show type class. Because PureScript has type classes, which is, yeah, how to, how to summarize type classes. Uh, essentially, they're, they're like interfaces in Java, pretty much. Close enough. Anyway, the show type class, you have to implement that for, for the wrapper to be able to, to print the value on the screen. So I've just pre, pre built that. But let's try constructing a list cons1, cons2, cons3, nil. Well, maybe I should compile it first. Whoa, 1, 2, 3, nil. That's essentially a, a cons list, as, as any Lisper would know. So let's create a function for that. Let's have a map function. They're cool. So of course, this is a type language. We are going to have two type variables, a and b. In PureScript, you have to declare them, unlike in Haskell. Um, and it takes a function from a to b. And it takes a list of a. And it returns a list of b. And if you map a function over the empty list, you get the empty list. Actually, then we don't care about the function. So we replace it with an underscore, which means I don't care. And if you, you map it over, um, we're doing pattern matching here on the const constructor. So usually in, in Haskell, it's traditional to go x and x's, uh, meaning the head and the tail. Uh, I do have some Lisper roots that I'm going to call, call it car and cutter, which I find much clearer. So that would be constructing a list with the head being a function applied to A, and the tail being uh, a recursive call to map uh, on function and, sorry, A, car. And this one on the cutter. So I wonder if this works. So let's take that list, map, um, plus 1 over that. And that gives us 2, 3, 4, nil. That seems to work. We've got the map function. Of course, what that means is what sort of, of, of word from category theory could we choose for this? It is a, a functor. Very good. So I'm going to write a functor implementation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to provide an instance of the functor type class for list. Uh, that does not need um, constraints. It should be just functor list where. And we have to implement the aptly named uh, less than dollar greater than function. <laughs> and we have an implementation for that. It's map. So it's said now of map plus one over the list, we go plus one however you pronounce that, functor probably. Um, actually, I, I, I pronounce it map. It's just a funny spelling. So that should now do the same thing. Whoa, we have implemented a functor. We are getting into category theory. Ooh. <laughs> so I figured I'd, I'd dwell a little on this subject because it's my favorite subject ever. Now, a lot of people already have already done um, the tutorial at this conference. So I'm not going to I'm not going to go into that. But I'd figured we'd be talking a little bit about 
my favorite um, my favorite thing in category theory semi groups so this is another algebraic data type which I've called pair. Uh, in my game engine, I deal with coordinates a lot. So the pair data type can be quite useful. Think of it as an X and Y coordinate pair. And I got a function add pairs, which uh, takes two pairs and add them together. It's essentially the, add the X's together and the, the Y's together and form a new one. So let's see if that works. Uh, first pair one T, that works. Add pairs. Pair one two. Let's go crazy and go with pair three four here. That's four six. Yeah. So um, this seems to have an associated property. So what does that mean? It forms a, a semi group. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. It could form a monoid as well. We'll get to that. Patience. So instance semi group. Pair. So in case you didn't catch that, um, if you have a data type and you have the ability to perform an associated binary operation on that data type, meaning, for instance, adding two numbers together, that counts, that forms a semigroup. So the rule is, uh, essentially, let me type that out for you in pseudocode. Uh, if you got A plus B plus C, and it equals A plus B plus C with a parenthesis like this, then that, um, that means it has the associated property, and thus it forms a semigroup. Now let's implement the semigroup. The semigroup function is called less than, greater than. And we've implemented that as add pairs. So now. This forms a semigroup. And of course, the semigroup type class is generalized. So you have a few functions that can operate over semigroups. And so you get, just by implementing this, um, this type class instance, you get a lot of functionality for free. Works well, the same way. Now, did somebody say monoid? Should we try? Probably shouldn't be dwelling too much on this. I've got a game to write as well. Uh, let's, I like monoids. Let's do one. So, being very strange when you're scrolling today, aren't you? So that was a semi-group and monoid. Ah. And that would just be monoid pair. Where, so what's, uh, what's special about a monoid? Sorry? Uh, I would go with the, the uh, empty value, actually. <laughs> so um, anything that has the associated property is a semigroup. And if there is also a value for which you can take any value and add that value, you get uh, the original value unchanged. In, um, effectively, like this, a plus empty equals a. If there is such a value, you have a monoid. So M empty is what it's called. Uh, what do you think? Zero and zero, obviously. So we are not in category theory. This is fun. So I need to Im import data monoids to be able to access that. So now instead of pair one, two, and pair three, four, I can go pair one, two plus M empty. And PureScript's type system is going to um, infer that when I'm talking about I'm, I'm empty in this case, I'm talking about the particular implementation for, for pairs, because the other one is a pair, so this one has to be. So that should get us what? It should get us pair one, two, of course. And indeed it does. I'm much, much relieved to see this. One more thing I want to show you before we get uh, onto the game right, yeah. So. Uh, wow, stop doing that. I told you I wrote this, this yesterday. So I lost my semigroup and mono definitions now, but that's fine. I don't think we need them. Yes, we do actually. The semigroup instance semigroup pair. 
Alasami grip pa wa. This one is ad pass, and that should do it. Now I want to show you quick check because quick check is amazing. So I've added this uh, this. Uh, in oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> Never mind, quick check. Oh, sh yeah. <laughs> OK, this is broken. So I wanted to show you uh, how I can actually show you the code at least. But I'm not going to type that semi group one more time. So this is an, an implementation of the arbitrary type class, which essentially um, provides a way to generate random values for pass in this case. So you could write a function. It's not going to work, but I'm going to do it anyway. Pair is semi group. And the cool thing is I can just give a type signature and it should yield a result. And quick check when I run it on this test is going to be able to uh, understand that it needs to generate three values per pair and, and call this test with those random values. And of course, it does that like 100 times. and. It's a very good way of, of checking. OK, I'm so deep into it now. I'm going to do it, OK? Pa, sanity group, pa, don't touch the mouse. Uh, is add pass. OK, now I'm able to actually call this function I've, I've built um, elsewhere called verify semi group which essentially takes anything that forms a semigroup and runs tests on it to see if it fulfills the associated property. So I go uh, test quick check, and it's quick check pure. Zero is the seed, 100 is the, the number of tests. I'm totally not going to be able to finish my game now, but you see, it runs a lot of tests. So let's just do 10. It's easier to see. And they all seem to succeed. We need a failing test. So let's multiply by x1. And now you see it fails. And now you actually see it's failing. It, it's telling you what's failed. Now, sadly, PureScript's uh, quick check implementation isn't doing this automatically. This is my verify semigroup function which is uh, printing the output of the, of the input of the tests uh, that failed. And you see there are lots of random values here. So that was a very, very efficient way of, of writing a test, wasn't it? So generate your tests, said John Hughes. Don't write them. All right, that was fun. Now actually, let's actually do something real. So. We've got 12 minute, minutes left. Let's see if we can build a game in that time. I think I'm pushing it, but let's try. So fortunately, I got some pre-written code here. I got a game object type, which is um, a record, which um, compiles exactly to a JavaScript object. Uh, the record has a few fields, uh, ID, CSS. These, um, these map directly to and DOM IDs and classes. And we got coordinates, we got base coordinates, we've got uh, velocities because uh, this represents an object in the game and the objects can move around. So essentially, uh, there should be a rendering function for this. Uh, let's see, and I've got this uh, intersects function here that I'm going to need, and I didn't want to type it out. I'm going to show you, let's see. Get some. Oh, why do you keep doing this? All right, well, I guess we stick to the bottom then. So I'm going to show you the FFI because uh, this render function just does a lot of things to the DOM. And let's do that in JavaScript. Oh my god, this is so squished in. So. It takes where'd you go? for all e. This is an effectful uh, computation. So it takes a game object. Sorry about the tininess, but and it returns an effect monad. Sorry, I said the word. Oh my god! It 
returns an effect computation, which has the dumb effect, which is defined elsewhere. And because um, here's some, a bit of row polymorphism, it takes an effect that must have the DOM effect, but can have lots of other effects as well, is what I'm saying here. And it returns a unit, which means nothing. So I'm going to be lucky if I can even get the ground moving. Uh, so the effect type must return a function. So it should be this. I wish it didn't keep sitting at the bottom. I can't see what I'm doing. OK, let's try and deal with it. So the first thing we do is get the document element by ID object dot ID, which is from the uh, game object type. Oh, Phil, we need uh, multi-line strings, please. I hate typing these backslashes. Cool. OK, uh, we need to set the class. And that's a CSS. Sorry, this is the most boring function in the whole game. Of course, because it's JavaScript. Oh, this is so much typing. I should have just left this in. Now, for the CSS, we set left plus O base x plus O x float. This is an ASMJS trick to chop off, to turn a number into an integer. And pixels, semicolon, top colon, uh, and string please. And base y. So why? Bear with me, please. Uh, plus pixels. I'm so sick of this now. I'm not even doing new lines where I should. OK. And return nothing. That should do it. Yes, I see. Is that it? Last line. Oh, yeah. Thanks. I did not see that. OK. So very quickly, now this is where I should have, have elaborated on how I, how I have actually taken um, Evan's very lovely uh, LM signal library and sort of tried to port it to PureScript. Um, instead, I'm just going to hurriedly type it out. So we need a frame rate. It takes a signal that yields a number. And we've got a function every, which takes a number of milliseconds and yields uh, the current time every 33 milliseconds in this case. That's going to give us a frame rate of about, what is it, 25, 30 uh, frames per second. Let's keep this one here. And the ground, I'm going to create a stream for that. That's going to yield game objects. And we're going to start that off with a frame rate. And then, sorry, uh, this is um, this is the map function, actually. But it's got this very neat syntax in Elm that I felt like I, I copied over. I, I could do it in, in the traditional Haskell way. Um, for some reason, Evan didn't find that very readable. Don't know what his problem is, but. Actually, I kind of agree. <laughs> so this is much nicer. So what I'm saying here is, well, where we? we got a function. n is going to be uh, the number that comes out of frame rate. And we need to create a game object. It's going to be called ground. And the CSS is going to be nothing special. Uh, X is going to be, now this is some computation I arrived at through science, which means trial and error. 
just going to make the ground move the way I want it to, uh, multiplied by minus 8. And y should be 0. And the base x, that's also the uh, zero position of the coordinate system for this object, is minus 128 and 384. And I've got five minutes left. Hopefully, that's going to be a hint of a pony, at least. Um, Vx0, Vy0. I'm not going to be using the velocity system for this. Now we need a main function. Uh, so this is stu notation, which has to do with the M word. And <laughs> essentially, this is um, we're going to be doing effect computa effectful computation here. So we are going to be doing this in the effect burrito, as they are sometimes called. Uh, so I'm going to run that signal with an effectful endpoint. So I go ground. Ground is a signal. And I map the render ob object function over it. Now, my god. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Has it crashed? It probably has, actually. Yeah. So I've got it on the clipboard. I'm so nervous right now. I need to refresh the page. And well, can I select this, please? Oh, yeah, I have to do that manually. OK. It's moving. God. Now, let's see if we can do a pony in five minutes. The pony should be jumping. And first of all, uh, let's see. We need the velocity function. It's going to be useful for all of them. I'm just going to skip this type signature here, I think, because I'm running so much out of time. So it takes the game object, and it modifies the game object with x should be ox plus ovx. And y should be oy plus ovy. And that's essentially it. That's the velocity function. And we need a gravity function as well, which essentially takes a game object and applies uh, downwards gravity on it. So that means that the VR, VY is increased by, what's gravity? 0.98 newtons. Is it newtons? Yeah. And so we need a pony. Which pony should we go for? Yes. Good choice, because it's the only one I have uh, graphical assets for. And. I think it needs a key stream as input because she's going to jump. We'll deal with that later. We're going to create a fold that is essentially, uh, we're going to have a function that modifies Pinky uh, for each frame. And we're going to do that using the Pinky logic function that we're going to implement. I'm going to have an initial Pinky value. And I'm going to map that over, sorry, fold that over. Sample on frame rate keys, which every um, tick of frame rate should, should give us whether or not the keys in, in the key stream will be pressed. The key stream, uh, let's see, let's go with the space bar. So that's code 32. And the ground current independently. Let's go with another one. P. Uh, render object. Let's define P as pinky over space bar. So, whew. I think I'm actually out of time. Let's just see if we can actually get pinky rendering first. 
shouldn't be too much left. It's too bad I wanted to get it to jump, but I think I got carried away with the category theory, didn't I? Um, well, how are you, Pinky? Pinky logic um, takes a space bar and it takes a pinky. And we apply gravity and we apply velocity. And wow, it's crashed again. Okay, so here we go. This is scary. Uh, refresh. Okay, you know what? Since we are out of time, I actually realized I have a copy of this game that is complete. <laughs> so that couldn't be very unexciting for you. I think you'd rather have lunch, to be honest. So, very quickly, running through. So, Pinky. I wish this scrolled better. So essentially, the pinky logic function, I was extended, extended it now. I, I missed that joke, sorry, where she falls through the ground because of gravity. And I haven't made the ground solid. So there's a solid ground function, and I've implemented jump. And they, as you notice, are, are quite simply composable functions that go from game object to game object. So this is very neat and, and, and pure and functional, at least. Uh, let's see if there are some other highlights. No. Not really. So there's the jump function. And here's initial pinky, yes. And I've also got this coin that she's supposed to connect, um, which simply just, just moves from, from off screen um, and, and loops back. And if she jumps and touches it, uh, using CoinLogic has this very neat pattern matching thing, um, where if you intercept with pinky, whose stream I'm actually having to feed into the coin stream because uh, the coin has to react to Pinky, so it needs to know where she is. Um, and I put the coin on screen, and I put Pinky on screen, and let's just see if it works. It seems to. I missed that coin. She can jump, as you can see. And she can get the coins. And... <laughs> And that was uh, not very much pure script at all, wasn't it? And oh, stop doing that. I got the worst slide system ever. This, ha this is what happens when you write your own. But you know, at least then you know that you're using it before it was cool. So <laughs> this is all the code it took for, for, for a game. And Apart from this ugly bit of JavaScript right here, this is all purely functional, which is pretty cool. And enough of that. I won't keep you from lunch. Hello, Pinky. Ooh. OK. So that was it. Now, um, before we go, um, I usually put links to my slides here. But as you can see, I need to get the bugs out first. And I'm also uh, just about to publish the Signal library and, and some of the other things that I've been, been building uh, on the side towards this game engine. I'm also going to hopefully um, publish the game engine itself once it's done. But I wouldn't hold my breath for that. It needs a little, a little more thinking. So, well, thank you very, very much. I hope it at least piqued your interest in, in pure scripts. Also, Adam. Adam is, Adam is cool. And yeah, go have lunch, please. I'm sure there are, there's absolutely no time for questions. Go.